I've just talked to you about the ongoing coup and counter coup that is being initiated by the Clintons on the one hand and counter coup by the FBI, the New York Police Department, and other branches of our intelligence community. The important part to remember is also that not all the information has come out with regards to Wiener and his sexting to a 15-year-old North Carolina teenager. The real issue underlying a lot of Bill Clinton's nefarious activities as well as Hil Hillary Clinton's sexual activities is the fact that we know that both of them have been a major part and participant of what's called the Lolita Express, which is a plane owned by Mr. Jeff Epstein, a wealthy multimillionaire who flies down to the Bahamas and allows Bill Clinton and Hillary to engage in sex with minors. That is called pedophilia. And as a result of the excellent work that the New York Police Department does in tracking uh, pedophiliacs, they also have a record of both Hillary, Bill, and other people associated with the Clintons with regard to pedophilia. So not only will she be charged with obstruction of justice, with lying to a prosecutor in the FBI, she will also be charged with pedophilia, sex with minors, and other assordry issues. Bill might be brought up again on certain charges because those charges still relate to American crime and prosecutorial issues. But I do want to inform you that we are well aware in the intelligence community of their activities that hasn't stopped. And we're not talking about one trip to the Bahamas, we're talking about a multiple of 20 or 30 trips that Bill and Hillary did take separately and together to, on the Lolita Express to engage in sexual activities with minors. I hope you continue to listen to what we have to say. This is Dr. Steve Pachenik, and I will keep on informing you as to what is happening in this second American Revolution that we are witnessing in 2016. Thank you, Uma. Thank you, Uma. Thank you, Anthony Weiner. I'm not making any excuses, but I will tell you this. If they want to look at some more emails of one of my staffers, by all means, go ahead. Now, Donald Trump and I, we, 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 we commend the FBI for reopening the case because no one is above the law in the United States of America. In some ways, the enthusiasm kind of jacked up this weekend. You know, there may be some distractions, but we won't be distracted. The good news is the president believes that Director Comey is a man of integrity. He's a man of principle. Director Comey made a great mistake. I think he needs to try to correct that. Last week, they're ordering up their inaugural ball gowns, and this week, the Clinton campaign is in the worst communication crisis. No matter how good the election result, if you are a criminal, if you run afoul of the system, if you, if you have obstructed justice, the system grinds you down. System grinds you down? I don't think it grinds you down. It has been a grind getting to where we're at. Seven, seven. That is the operative number this morning. We oh, have really? one more week. Next Tuesday, you're going to be going to the polls, voting for whichever one you want to be your And then we're going to need you to answer the exit polls. When people ask you who you voted for, please be honest, because we don't want to have to wait till Wednesday. <laughs> all right, so we've got a big program one week out. Trey Gowdy is going to be joining us. We're going to talk to him about all sorts of things regarding this uh, email thing. Also, Plus, Speaker Paul Ryan's going to be with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not had him on in a long time. There's a few better guests that we could have right now. Judge Jeanine Piero's here. She actually wants to get clear on what she did in her open over the weekend. She thinks it's being misconstrued. All right, Judge Napolitano is also going to be joining us. That's right, and Laura Ingram. So we've got a busy three hours. It starts one week out and starts right now. That's right, and all hands are on deck at the DOJ exactly one week out from this presidential election. 
Investigators there using, quote, all necessary resources. As Hillary Clinton insists, there's nothing to see in the new trove of emails found on aid Huma Abedin's laptop. All right, Kristen Fisher is live in Washington following the rapidly developing uh, and unfolding investigation. Kristen, they really want to get this done, don't they? They do, but it seems almost impossible before Election Day. Right now, FBI agents are scouring through thousands of emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop, looking for any that might be pertinent to the Clinton case. But attorneys for Weiner's estranged wife and top Clinton aide Uma Abedin say their client has no idea how her emails got onto that laptop. Quote, she only learned for the first time on Friday from press reports of the possibility that a laptop belonging to Mr. Weiner could contain emails of hers. While the FBI has not contacted us about this, Ms. Abedin will continue to be as she has always been forthcoming and cooperative. Now, Abedin is notorious for never being more than a few feet away from her boss, but ever since this story broke, she's been noticeably absent, even as the campaign enters its final full week. Yesterday, Clinton campaigned without her in the battleground state of Ohio, and Clinton repeatedly said that the FBI has no case. She repeatedly tore into FBI Director James Comey. She even invited FBI agents to keep on digging, but insisted they won't find anything. I've said repeatedly, um, I, uh, you know, I made a mistake. I'm not making any excuses, but I will tell you this. If they want to look at some more emails of one of my staffers, by all means, go ahead, look at them. And I know they will reach the same conclusion they reached when they looked at my emails last year. Now, in that clip, Clinton makes what some are perceiving to be a very telling remark. She refers to Abedin simply as one of my staffers, when previously she'd referred to her as like a second daughter. So now, here we are, exactly one week away from Election Day, and Clinton appears to be no longer traveling with one of her closest confidants. Very telling. Brian Ainsley and Steve. Wow. It's uh, the fantastic, Kristen. It's, it's just going to be so Thank interesting you. because now, yesterday we weren't sure how much they were going to focus on trying to get as much done before Election Day. Today we understand that the Justice Department will be looking over the shoulders of the FBI as they use the sophisticated software to go through it. They're going to break it down to sender and subject line. They're going to have keywords, secret or classified. They're going to cultivate it that way. Look at other words like Benghazi. And the FBI agents, there's going to be some more uh, called in to get this done. Right. Now, the Justice Department and FBI, their rivalry is actually going to help us get to the bottom of this, which will give us an additional October, dare I say, November, November. surprise. Because today is November 1st. The interesting thing is, though, the person apparently at the Department of Justice who's going to be overseeing this is somebody who has uh, dinner frequently with John Podesta. That's not too cozy, is it? Mm. All right. Meanwhile, let's tell you about this. Okay, it was a bombshell on Friday when James Comey uh, released to Congress a letter saying, look, we're looking at, we found a whole bunch of email and we're looking into it. Now Reuters is reporting that apparently on Thursday, the day before, Comey uh, was actually briefed on the email situation by his top aides. And then uh, over at the Department of Justice, Loretta Lynch found out about it and she asked for a meeting apparently. And they sat together in a room and she was explaining that if he were to release a letter, it would violate uh, department policy. It's just simply too close to an election. If he released this letter to Congress and he's saying, wait a minute, are you trying to interfere? Are you trying to tell me to stand down? Right. Are you she backed off then. And he actually then went ahead and reached the letter. The other thing is, when people bring up uh, Loretta Lynch, this is just uh, underlining the rivalry between the two. And, of course, Loretta Lynch had to recuse herself because she was with the former president and the husband of the candidate. So she goes, I'll recuse myself and give it to my deputy. So then she put herself back in. Then she backs out. Now they're back in looking over the shoulder of the FBI to try to get this done by election the day. The question is, say, <coughs> why would she say it's violating policy if you send this letter? Could to be the Hatch Act, but it's not. Upon mm -hmm. further review, it doesn't violate the Hatch Act. It, well, it's, it's something completely... Or is it because she didn't want the information out? Those are two different things. And so, it, a longstanding tradition, apparently, at the Department of Justice, you don't release this if, if it could if affect the outcome the of an election. But he specifically said, are you ordering me not to do this? You know, are you ordering me to keep this bombshell secret? She did not say he could not send it out. And the next day, 
he sent it out. Yeah, it's just amazing how many critics, even some Republicans are critical of James Comey. How many critics <laughs> would there have been in the middle of January when it came out on October 3rd, field, the FBI field office found it. Two weeks later, Comey was given the information about it, and he kept it under wraps through Election Day for another month when they find out whatever's inside the 650,000. There would have been additional outrage then. Right. Well, did you watch any of the mainstream media yesterday and how they were covering this? They I were did. They were all blaming it on James Comey. Of course. Yeah. Except so, for the White House, who I thought was very mature about the whole thing. They would not impugn James Comey, uh, and they still have confidence in him. Let's take a look at some of the graphics over at ABC. Uh, despite the fact that we don't know the outcome of the election, you can see right there, the graphic says there is no case here. All right. And then some of the evening news is depicted what's going on uh, in this way. Well, it, since you put up the graphic, let's go ahead and just mention right now, when it came to anti-Comey statements, there were 80, 88 of them. And despite the fact that they were investigations into Hillary, there were 31. So, so you three know, to one, they were more about. critical of Comey than they were Hillary. Sure. Anyway, here's a little montage of the nightly news is going after Mr. Comey, that bad guy. Hillary Clinton, meantime, in the battleground of Ohio, where early voting is already underway, telling voters, quote, there is no case here. Clinton's team now counting on their get out the vote operation. More than 23 million votes already cast. Democrats outpacing Republicans in battlegrounds like North Carolina and Nevada. The October surprise that rocked the race for president on Friday may not have rocked it enough to move the needle with voters. Clinton campaign seizing moments ago on a new report that FBI Director James Comey was reluctant to publicly blame Russia for cyber hacking Democrats this close to the election. They call that a jaw-dropping double standard. So, right. They drew it desperately to try to change the narrative to something that was away from either ripping Comey or about Trump and Russia, which was just a tremendous leap. Even the New York Times today, New York Times yeah. has an article on like the 11th page. Of I course. Think. The 21st page. And the, the, uh, the article is about how the FBI sees no clear link to link Donald Trump sure. with Russia. With so Russia you know what's so interesting? Let's look at the first page. Donald Trump in the 1990s used a tax tactic uh, now banned. Really? Don't you think the headline should have been that page nine that there's no Russian no link. link to Donald Trump? But what about this? This ridiculous um, uh, magazine, which has turned into a flyer in this time in which the most heated election ever, <laughs> this is the headline, don't send a teen to jail. It's so you, funny you say you that. You can't find a new trend, for example, a Trump. Uh, Look, Brian, you know, in the tiny little, right here, President Bax Comey, man you know, Steve, of I integrity, corrected. just a tiny I, it's little. It's so funny. When I, I am so embarrassed now. <laughs> when I came in this morning, I didn't know you were going to do that, because when I came in this morning, I was looking for articles about the latest. Right. And this was the head of the New York Post with the latest on Hillary Clinton. Right. And then I I saw the Daily News. I was like, what? Good. Sure. I just yeah. pushed that aside. Who left last it? year's out? The <laughs> premature premature elation is the fact that Hillary Clinton has already uh, bought fireworks. She's going to have a two-minute display once she wins at 9.30 uh, in the Hudson River. Next on to the Gavitt Center, where I hope she's going to be celebrating. The yeah. Gucci family. They are very good at fireworks. What will they do with the fireworks, though? What if she doesn't win? Do what? they still have the firework display? Yeah, you, know what? you lose your deposit. There is a, there's a quote in the New York Post that says maybe they'll take it over to the East River and sell it half price to Donald Trump. <laughs> Meanwhile, over at CNN, uh, apparently they've had it up to here with uh, Donald of Brazil, who has been a longtime commentator there, and uh, after the latest WikiLeaks dump revealed that she w has been fed two questions uh, to the Hillary Clinton campaign, she has been fired. And supposedly CNN is just, uh, they're floored. Right. They also got rid of Bernard Shaw. Listen, she was, uh, she's now taking over the DNC. Of course she's not participating at CNN. She was left, they said they got rid of her October 14th. She said a nice tweet back how much she loved the people at CNN. Bottom line is, it's got to be exceedingly embarrassing for somebody who's a commentator to somehow get a hold of the questions ahead of time, feed them to her favorite candidate, fill in the name Hillary Clinton, not Bernie Sanders. That is two. You know what she said at the end of this? 
more to come. Right. Maybe she, she even fed additional she ones. She was suspended from CNN this summer when she took on the role of DNC chair. Right. Then she, she was, according to CNN, she resigned on October 14th. And you're right, like two weeks ago, we learned that she was feeding some of the questions. Right. Remember in that one email to Podesta? And then the latest WikiLeaks is saying that she gave a question ahead of the Flint, Michigan debate. To a woman with a rash. Right, right. What is Bernie Sanders thinking now? Because this was, this was in the primary. This was sure. when she was debating. This is what CNN said. They said, we are completely uncomfortable with what we have learned about her interactions with the Clinton campaign while she was a CNN contributor. Here's the thing. Um, I was reading on thehill.com this morning, Joe Concha, a media yeah. watchdog, he said, CNN really needs to have an internal investigation to figure out how this all happened. For instance, with the first one, uh, you know, it sounds like Roland Martin, remember him, longtime CNN guy, fed the question to Donna Brazile for that town hall. CNN needs to figure out what went wrong over there right. just so that it doesn't By go the way, wrong again. Congratulations on the questions. You're in Flint, Michigan, talking about the water crisis, and the question was, be prepared. A woman's going to ask you about the water crisis or what you're going to do about it with lead in the pipes. That's true. That really, was... thanks. I'd be like, excuse me, do you have that little confidence in me? You have to feed me that question right, ahead right. of time? Right. If they're talking about the makeup of the type of you know, lead Donald... that's in the pipe, I get it. Give me a heads Donald up. Donald Trump said if this were reverse, if Reince Priebus were giving us the questions, I would get the electric chair. Right. Uh, it, right. would, it would be a joke. All right, guys, seven days from the election. Fox News has election day coverage. We've got you covered starting at 4 a.m. and all night as the votes are coming in. So you need to stay with Fox News Channel, America's election headquarters. And we have a new studio. It's so cool. That's right. Just throw away it. your remote. Leave it here on yes. Fox. Meanwhile The president believes that Director Comey is a man of integrity, he's a man of principle, and he's a man of good character. These same character traits are what led a strong majority of Democratic and Republican senators to confirm him to this job. These are the traits that led the president to select him to be the director of the FBI. Well, after FBI Director James Comey recommended against indicting Hillary Clinton, or charges, that is to say, and considered the investigation into her email over back in July, he was reportedly overwhelmed with resignation requests and regret. This according to a close source of Comey's who spoke to writer Ed Klein, who joins us right now live. His book is called Guilty of as Sin. Ed, nice to have you. Great to be here. Okay. Um, so ever since July, apparently the, the rank and file FBI agents were really steamed at him. And inside the FBI, the, to the atmosphere is toxic. When James Comey would walk down the hallways of the FBI and say good morning, right. people wouldn't talk back to him. That's how bad things had been in the FBI. There's a sense that, the, that he disgraced the institution and brought it down. And he has been suffering because this is a guy who is an evangelical Catholic who gets down on his knees every night and prays to God. Mm -hmm. He has this sense of moral rectitude. He thinks that he knows what's right. And it, it, put, him, it put him in a, in a, a direction that actually mm -hmm. was a, a disaster for him and the, and the institution. So if he had a do-over, would he have uh, suggested charges? I think he would have because yeah. According to my sources, he and his wife, Patrice, mm -hmm. who are very, very close, not only in their marriage, but in his professional life, she has been telling him, Jim, you did the wrong thing. You've got to do, redeem yourself yeah. somehow. So when he learned about the emails in Anthony Weiner's laptop, mm -hmm. he jumped at the chance sure. to reopen this case. Because uh, two things. One, apparently he had been talking to his wife, Patrice, according to your uh, report, that he was depressed that so many resignation letters from FBI agents were stacking up on his, uh, on his desk, but also the harm he felt that was being done to the FBI. That's right. Now, he hasn't signed these resignation letters because he's hoping that he can undo the damage. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the interesting things here is that the president of the United States has so uh, politicized the Justice Department that Loretta Lynch has been interfering in this entire investigation from the very, very beginning. 
and has given Comey a hard time at every step of the way because mm -hmm. the president, the Justice Department are all trying to get Hillary Clinton elected sure. president. Uh, one of our stories today is a Reuters report that apparently Comey uh, Revealed that they found, you know, reportedly over half a million of these email on this uh, Wiener laptop. And uh, the day before, on Thursday, Comey met with Lynch. And Lynch said, if you release a letter to yeah. Congress, that violates policy, yeah. longstanding DOJ policy. And then he said, are you ordering me to keep this bombshell a secret? And she said nothing. Yes. And the reason for that is because James Comey has a reputation of threatening to resign if he doesn't get his way. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine seven days before the election if the director of the FBI resigned? I mean, this would throw the entire justice system sure. into complete chaos. And we opened this segment with some sound bites of uh, Josh Ernest talking glowingly about uh, director well, Comey being a man of integrity, but in your in one of your earlier books, didn't Barack Obama regard appointing James Comey as the worst mistake of his presidency? The worst mistake of my presidency. Now today they're coming out and saying, "Oh no, this guy has got complete integrity." Now the president doesn't want to look as though he's interfering in the election either. Right. So this is a complete mess at the very top of our criminal justice system. I would call it a constitutional crisis in the making at this very moment. Donald Trump said the same thing. All right, his uh, big bestseller is called Guilty of Sin. Ed Klein, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. FBI Director James Comey feeling the heat from all over pretty much today in Washington for his decision to publicly notify Congress that he needed to reopen the Clinton email investigation. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley telling Director Comey that he didn't go far enough in explaining what is going on, saying, quote, in the absence of additional authoritative information from the FBI in the wake of your vague disclosure, Congress and the American people are left to sift through anonymous leaks from Justice Department officials to the press of varying levels of detail, reliability and consistency. The American people deserve better than that, says Chuck Grassley. Let's bring in Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review, and Rich, Richard Fowler is radio talk show host. Both are Fox News contributors. Gentlemen, welcome. Good Hi, to Martha. have you here. Good uh, here, this morning. So um, let me start with you, Rich Lowry, on this. Do you agree with Grassley? Well, that letter on Friday, it was so opaque, it was almost impossible to understand. But let's be honest here. Comey was put in an extremely difficult situation by the fact that Hillary Clinton had this email set up in the first place, and the Democrats nominated a presidential candidate who was under FBI investigation. So this was always going to be very tricky mm. to handle. So I'm open to criticisms that he should have handled this or that differently, but I'm not open to the idea that he's a hack and a criminal, as Harry Reid suggested the other day, from the same Democrats who the day before yesterday were hailing him as a wonderful yeah. patriot and public servant. That's well, we, just we disgraceful. Have to be careful here because we're, we're really dealing with you know, the institutions that are so meaningful and crucial in this country. Um, and there is so much loose talk going around about the FBI and about the Department of Justice. But as we try to sort of weed through this and figure out whether or not he did the right thing and what comes next, um, there's another editorial today by William Barr, who was the Attorney General uh, from 1991 to 1993, who argues that, that Comey, in his mind, did exactly the right thing. He has the opposite viewpoint from Grassley. He says the failure of the Clinton camp to provide all pertinent evidence rendered Comey's July announcement misleading. The FBI's investigation was not comprehensive and not complete, and the conclusions announced by Comey three months ago were therefore premature. So he's saying, uh, Richard Fowler, that he had to come forward now because he knows that there is more information than he thought, and they have to go through it. Your thoughts? This is a problem. Here's the problem, Martha, and thanks for having me in. Good to see you, Rich. Uh, here, the, the larger problem that we have here is that this is all against FBI protocol. The FBI never gives status updates on pending investigations. They've never done it, right? And the fact that, so he, he, he tipped his toe in the water the first time, and so now the second tip is even more problematic. And, and I think Rich is right. This letter that he sent to Congress a couple days ago was opaque, and I think it caused, it caused a lot of questions, which led to the leaks, because you have this side leak, 
leaking, you have this side leaking, there's leaks all over places, like a really bad leaky roof, and the American people are left holding the bag with just seven days to go before yeah. a major election. I mean, it, William Barr <laughs> argues, this former attorney general, and you can read the piece in the Wall Street Journal, argues that that's not true, that, that it does not go against FBI policy, and that because he, his former statement was that they had been through everything, uh, and now he realizes that they have not been through everything. He really had no choice. He was going to influence something, whether he did it before the election or right after the election. Um, and it is a tight place. I'm sure he would you know, be the first to admit it if he were at liberty to discuss it, that he's in a tough spot, Rich Lowry. Right. Well, the, the public was under the impression that the investigation was closed because the director of the FBI had told Congress that. So that was a misleading impression. It was no longer true. Right. And he felt the obligation to let the public know it was no longer true. Now, uh, to Richard's point, you could argue that he never should have gone down this road in the beginning, in July. He just should have made his recommendation to the Justice Department the way you always do, not comment on anything. But, but it was, uh, you know, there was such public interest on this, yeah. he felt as though it couldn't just be a black box. I, I mean, there's, there's already so much about this that is so irregular. The fact that there was no grand jury, the fact that witnesses acted as lawyers and sat next to Hillary Clinton during her testimony, Richard Fowler, uh, the fact that, that there was a promise made to them to destroy their laptops. You have to wonder at this point if Huma Abedin hadn't wished that she got in, she got in on that part of the deal um, <laughs> because hers is still now out there. So there, there are so many issues with the way that this was handled, that it leads people to believe, and, and voters seem to be responding to that in the polls, that there's just, there's something up here, that there was too much political influence on this investigation. Yeah, and I think the influence goes both ways. Judge Napolitano on Kelly File said last night that, you know, that's exactly the problem with this whole entire investigation. There's way too much information being put out there. Nobody should have known about the immunity. Nobody should have known about the fact that people were asked to destroy laptops or not destroy laptops. And let's be very clear, in the affidavit that was said for the search warrant, the search warrant did not include Hillary Clinton at all. The search warrant was mainly involving, the affidavit was mainly involving Huma Abedin and not Hillary Clinton. And we don't know if these emails are duplicates. We don't know what these emails are. Martha, you don't know. Rich, you don't know. And I don't know. And now the American voters don't know, which is what the Clinton campaign this, is saying. They deserve the right to know, whether you're a Trump voter, a Hillary voter, or an independent. Every American, now that, now that Comey has stepped his foot into, the po into politics, they deserve the right to know. Well, but many Comey, people Comey didn't put his foot in politics. He surely and that's did. Why we're here. Six days uh, before Democrats the nominated five. someone with this legal exposure who is under FBI investigation. And this is why it's been a norm honored through most American history. You don't nominate for president someone under FBI investigation, because very bad things are going to happen. It's going to put the FBI in a Possible Trump situation. Trump University is under Richard, investigation. Richard, last I mean, word was the last the word. So now we've had another last word, and now we really have to go. Thank you very much, you guys. Good to see you both. Thanks Thank you so much. CNN cutting ties with Donna Brazile, the DNC chair. This after it was revealed that she leaked a question to the Clinton camp ahead of a CNN town hall during this past primary season. In a statement from the network, CNN says we are completely uncomfortable with what we have learned about her interactions with the Clinton campaign while she was a CNN contributor. End quote. There's more to that. Howie Kurtz is going through that now. Host of Media Buzz, Howard, good morning to you. Good morning, How Bill. deep does a scar like this run? when a network is ex exposed in this manner. Well, look, this whole episode has tarnished Donna Brazile, has tarnished the network that she betrayed, and also in a way tarnishes all of us in the media because there's so much suspicion out there about whether we're too cozy or colluding with the Clinton campaign. CNN hasn't helped itself by the way that it has handled this, which is to say poorly. Okay, now Joe Concha, media writer for TheHill.com, said this about what's happening inside CNN and what should happen based on his expectation. CNN, and I called for this a couple weeks ago, I'm going to do it again, needs to absolutely conduct an internal investigation by an outside firm to see where this cancer exists. What is you want to figure out who's talking to whom and how the information gets out? Is, is, this, is this the right next move, Howard? Yeah, but that's not even enough. CNN does need to investigate this because it goes to the heart of its credibility as a network. But let's review for a moment. Mm -hmm. First story about uh, Donna Brazile leaking a question in advance to uh, the Clinton campaign. Um, CNN didn't even sort of come out and condemn it. It kind of deflected the attention to its partner, TV One, saying the leak must have come from there. Now, we, And then, more than two weeks ago, CNN 
basically forced Donna Brazile out, officially it's being called a resignation, but didn't say a word publicly about it, apparently more concerned with protecting its image than being transparent. You know, we always, when politicians get in trouble, news organizations always say, well, they should go out there and answer the questions, they should be transparent. Mm -hmm. I think CNN President Jeff Zucker needs to address this publicly, needs to find out in this second instance, there's no partner, somebody at CNN gave her the question because she had the questions pretty much verbatim, uh, and needs to take some steps to explain how this happened, who's responsible, and why it wouldn't happen again. You know, I, I peel back the curtain just a little bit. You know, debate prep often is done in a quarantine nature. I know yeah. Chris Wallace, when he did the last debate, he worked with two people on his staff, and that was it. And they spoke to no one on the outside. When we were doing our own debate prep during the primary season, we would work with two others on staff and an assistant. So we, were, we had a group of five in a room for the final two days prior to the debate happening. So it... It keeps it restricted in terms of information, Howie, and um, the topics, perhaps, right. and, and most specifically, you know, the questions that will be chosen. Right. You can't have gossipy newsroom as part of the process. It has to be uh, kind of off in a separate silo. And why is that important? Because we all, whatever the network, we all are sort of telling the American people and the viewers that nobody knows the questions in advance, that the, both politicians or a bunch of politicians, if it's a primary debate, you know, are all on equal footing. But here's the built-in problem now. CNN was paying Donna Brazile as a contributor, she since went on leave because of becoming acting DNC chair, while she was vice chair of the Democratic National Committee that created a built-in sort of conflict of loyalties that she apparently decided to resolve in favor of helping the Hillary Clinton campaign even while Hillary was still running against Bernie Sanders. Now we all, all the networks have Democratic and Republican strategists right. who we expect to consult with the campaigns and come on and spin on behalf of their candidate. This is very different. It's, it's giving confidential information and CNN uh, really has a need here because I think CNN to some degree has been unfairly tarnished to explain how this happened, who's responsible, yeah. uh, and to the, try to assure final, people this won't happen. The final again. point yeah. to be made here, this was a town hall, so you're involving voters into the process too. And you have to figure out what's out on, the, on their mind. And you, you would not do that at the last minute. Those voters and those questions would be prearranged, which yeah, opens and the if, door even wider. Right, and it's not a shock, this latest example, the town hall was in Flint, Michigan. The questions were going to be about the tainted water supply there. But Donna Brazile told the Clinton folks that a particular woman who had a rash was going to make a very personal case. And, you know, it's good. It, it, it arms a candidate to have a more prepared response than if that comes out of the blue. But you're right. Uh, these, uh, these town halls are very well orchestrated. So only a select group of people should know that in advance. Maybe somebody who's part of the Democratic Party shouldn't be in yeah. that group. But there was a leak, a series of leaks. How we thank you, Howard Kurtz. We'll see where it goes and we'll see the effect of this after the election. Thank you, sir. Great Seven you. days to go. What difference at this point does it make? Does it make? Difference at this point does it make? What difference at this point does it make? What difference at this point does it make? What difference at this point? Difference at this point? What difference at this point does it make? <laughs>